So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here on this virtual medium. Uh, we are exploring different ways to connect with our audiences right now, uh, given the difficulty in hosting uh, larger, larger groups. Um, so I'm really pleased today to introduce uh, Dr. Lisanne Petraka um, as our vir virtual presenter um, in 2020. Uh, Lisanne holds a PhD in ecology from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, um, where she is currently a Roosevelt postdoctoral scholar. She also holds a Master of Environmental Management from Duke University, as well as a Bachelor of Science from Tufts University. Um, soon, Lisanne will be starting a new position at the University of Washington, where she will be studying wolves and their population status within Washington State. She has more than 10 years of experience in big cat conservation, having gotten her start as a conservation scientist at the nonprofit big cat conservation organization, Panthera. She has led research on jaguars, lions, and other big cats across the world, and really enjoys communicating her science with others, as I'm sure you will all be able to pick up from her presentation. Um, coexisting with carnivores is an ongoing challenge that developed and developing countries alike both face. Jaguars in South America, leopards and lions in Africa, and wolves and bears in North America draw many parallel themes impacting conservation efforts. Today we're going to hear a little bit about Lisanne's research to reduce lion and livestock conflict in Africa. So I hope you enjoy this presentation, and if you have any questions for Lisanne, please email them to uh, myself um, or drop an inbox there at the Facebook uh, Draper Natural History Museum. Um, and we will try to get those questions relayed. And hopefully we'll be able to see Lee San here in person next year. And thank you, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lee San Petraka. I am a Roosevelt postdoctoral scholar at the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. Um, I'd like to thank Corey Anko, who is the assistant curator at the Draper Natural History Museum, for inviting me to give a talk today. Now, I'm sure that most of the talks in your speaker series concern the ecology and natural history of species and systems in the Intermountain inter West. Um, but today we're going to expand our horizons and uh, go on a trip to the savannas of Southern Africa, um, particularly in Zimbabwe. As for me, I've worked in the big cat conservation field for about 10 years. Um, I was an employee at Panthera for about nine years. And while there, I was a geospatial analyst and then a conservation scientist. I also have research ties with uh, the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at Oxford University. And it's with Wild Crew um, that I collaborated with for the um, talk I am giving today. And in a couple weeks, I start a new job actually at the University of Washington, uh, leading the population assessment of wolves in the state. So yeah, one can say that I am a carnivore ecologist. And today um, I will be discussing two of my PhD chapters with you all, focusing on a program that chases lions to reduce conflict between um, lions and people. And I'll wrap up um, with a few minutes on tips for um, entering the field of big cat conservation. It's a question that I get a lot, so I figured I'd share what I have. All told, I predict this talk will go about 30 minutes, um, but feel free to tune in as you wish. So let's get started here. Looks like I have to use this arrow to move between slides. Okay, so. Um, I know uh, conflict between carnivores and livestock owners is certainly an issue in the Intermountain West, where you are, um, you know, including but not limited to with wolves, coyotes, and mountain lions. Um, and as I'm sure you also know, um, you know, uh, human carnivore conflict is certainly not restricted to the United States. Um, I did a literature review of about 178 peer reviewed journal articles on human carnivore conflict, and I found that it affects, you know, 37 species across six continents. And so what happens with human carnivore conflict, it just leads to a perpetual cycle of conflict in which carnivores will kill people's livestock, and then people will go after and kill carnivores in retaliation, 
and unfortunately um, carnivores in many cases continue to kill and so it's just this cycle that um, you know is really detrimental to both parties. So there are approaches to reduce human wildlife conflict. Um, they can be lethal or non-lethal. Examples of lethal control measures include, you know, hunting, poison baiting, or, you know, more targeted selective removal rather than just more broad hunting. Um, for non-lethal measures, you know, you have your fencing, uh, you have your visual, auditory, and chemical deterrence. For visuals, it can be, you know, flashing lights. For auditory, it could be the sounds of barking dogs or gunshots. So just many different um, strategies. So um, one non-lethal method uh, to prevent unwanted behaviors um, in carnivores has been through aversive stimulus approaches. Now what they do is it alters um, behavior by pairing an unwanted behavior with either pain or fear. With pain, examples include use of pepper spray and rubber bullets. And with fear, um, it can be chasing by dogs or chasing by people. Um, and in general, you want to ensure the stimulus is noxious enough to deter unwanted behaviors. And in the case of lions in, in our study area, it's the need to enforce the concept of these agricultural and residential areas as risky so that lions do not return. So lions um, are our focal species here. So they are vulnerable on the red list and there are anywhere between 23,000 and 39,000 mature individuals remaining. And we can see here, this is their historic range in that pale yellow color. And you know, this is what their range looks like now. So the dark brown is extant, meaning we're reasonably confident that lions persist there. And the orange is possibly extant, um, where lions may possibly be there, but we don't really know. Um, so we can see you know, that lions have lost a lot of their historic range. Um, they are extant in only 8% of that range. So our particular study area is called Huangay National Park. Um, it, is, it covers 14,600 square kilometers of semi-arid savanna in northwestern Zimbabwe. So normally I'd have my laser pointer, but it is that yellow um, national park um, in northwestern Zimbabwe. And you can see in the bottom left where Zimbabwe is um, relative to other countries within Africa. So Huangay is part of a greater um, protected areas system called the Kaza Transfrontier Conservation Area. And this is, in fact, Africa's largest conservation landscape. It um, encompasses 520,000 square kilometers, which is the size of Spain. So it's a really important network of you know, preserving connectivity for lions and other carnivores and um, you know, ungulates and other species in general. So, the Huangi Long Shields Community Guardians Program will be the um, topic of, of my talk today. So this is a really novel and really cool program, in my opinion, um, in which local people who are specifically trained and chosen for the job um, are hired to essentially protect community lands from lions entering and depredating livestock. So most lions in this area are um, collared with GPS collars and they are live tracked. And when lions get within two kilometers of community lands, um, a text message is sent to the guardians. And then the lions are actually chased on foot, um, sometimes by bicycle, sometimes by vehicle, but largely on foot by the guardians. And the guardians generally have a pupusella with them, which is what this guardian is displaying here. And it's essentially a, a horn that makes just a really loud, um, um, kind of annoying sound, and it's hoped that um, the blowing of the vuvuzelas, in addition to the presence of the guardians, will get lions away from community lands. So again, the goal is to recognize the community lands as high risk and to shift their space use to include more of the national park. So as of June 2012, there were 10 guardians operating um, in the areas around Huangi National Park. And what's great is that there's both men and women, and the women are doing a really tremendous job um, in protecting their communities. So the impact of the Long Shields program, so it started you know, in late 2011, early 2012, 
And we can see that in the two community areas bordering Quangate, there have been less depredation events by lions. By depredation, it means the killing of livestock animals um, in both community areas. And so we see that's a really nice decrease. We also see um, less lions killed um, by villagers as a result of entering um, community lands. So there's been less lions killed um, through problem animal control which is actually by the parks department, where when there's a nuisance animal, they will come in and remove it. Or, you know, in this case, they would be killing that animal. Um, there's been less deaths due to community retaliation, which is when the community members will go after a lion in response to a depredation event. And also through illegal poaching, which is um, the snaring of lion individuals, which is not um, legal in that area. So my first research question was, you know, in response to these individual chases by the lion guardians, what factors are associated with immediate chase success? And by chase success, I mean, um, if a lion is pushed out of where they're not supposed to be um, by sunrise of the next day. So has the chase been successful in pushing lions out of that, you know, exclusion zone um, by the next sunrise? And also what factors are associated with longer term behavioral changes by individual lions. And in this case, we looked at um, their repeated rates of entering community lands and also their rates of depredating livestock. So we are interested again in both the immediate factors. So in response to individual chases, what is getting these lions out? And then over a longer term, what factors are associated with lions um, entering community lands less and depredating livestock less. So we had a database of 15 GPS collared individuals. Uh, we had three adult female, six adult male, and six subadult male at the onset of the study. So each lion was monitored anywhere between three and a half and 21 months for an average of about a year. And each lion was chased between zero and 17 times for a total of 72 chase events. So here's our study area. So Huangue National Park is in the dark green. The light green are other protected areas such as forestry areas. And that hatched area, the black and white hatch is where lions are not supposed to be. So that is where those are large, those are actually exclusively community lands. And those red dots are households. So basically, we really want lions to be in the dark green, and we really don't want them to be in that black and white hatched area. So in order to determine what factors were associated with chase success, um, we used a mixed effects logistic regression um, where lion was a random intercept. If that makes no sense to you, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's just that's just our statistical framework. And for the factors associated with lion behaviors of entering community lands and depredating livestock, um, we used essentially a complicated survival model. Um, it allowed us to examine how certain factors influenced the rate or the hazard rate of a certain event happening at a particular point in time. It allowed us to incorporate multiple events per subject. And so that's how we got at that research question. Again, the statistical intricacies are not super important to this talk. So for covariate categories, by covariate, you know, it's, you know, what are those variables that we predict are associated with these behaviors? We had five categories and 25 total covariates. So one category was early intervention. So the depredation number at which chases began, that's one example. So, you know, by starting to chase them earlier, in their depredation sequence, perhaps we're preventing the development of these fixed nuisance behaviors. We also have positive reinforcement. Um, positive here kind of means the opposite thing. Um, so for the lion, it's positive in the sense that the more livestock that the lion has killed, um, you know, they're getting reinforced for that behavior with the reward of livestock. So with a long history of positive reinforcement of depredations, um, success may be more difficult for the guardians because this lion would have had a long history of reinforcement of bad behavior. We also had negative reinforcement, which here was the chase intervention on their previous entry. So we were really hoping that the chase intervention would lead to um, less frequency of these behaviors. This was a really, really interesting one. 
probably my favorite category of all the covariates. One example was the loss of a pride male in the last six months. So the loss of a pride male in this system, either through trophy hunting, which is a big source of loss of adult males in this area, or through um, problem animal control, which is when the, um, when the national parks, when they come in and um, will take out a male that has been causing issues or female, um, and also through poisoning and snaring. So when you lose a male in any of those ways, um, it's socially disruptive, and I will get into that later, but we thought that you know, perhaps it would be more difficult to chase lions in a pride when they've already gone through like, quite some social upheaval. And lastly, environmental resistance. So lions don't really like to move when it's super hot. So we thought that when there was a greater temperature at chase onset, that perhaps um, chase success would be more difficult. So um, we found that basically, uh, overall, 56% of chases were successful, meaning that lion was pushed out of the exclusion zone and in the direction of the national park by sunrise of the next day, and 44% were not. Um, but the more successful chases happened closer to the Huangi National Park boundary. So basically, um, the closer the line is to the park, the, easiest, the easier it is to get that line to move in the desired direction. So sometimes these lines were kilometers within community lands. In those cases, it will be a lot harder to chase them. Next, um, it's literally herding cats here. So the greater the pride size, the more difficult it is to get chase success. When you're chasing one or two young males, um, you know, it's, it's likely a lot easier than chasing a pride of eight to 10 individuals. So when there were just one or two, you had a mean success rate of 90%, whereas when you had eight to 10 lions, it became 16%. Also, um, again, my favorite covariate here, pride and stability. So this is a huge, huge result, in my opinion, where when you have pride and stability, so when you've lost a pride male in the last six months, um, your success goes from around 88% to 56%. And that's because when you're taking out a pride male, there's going to be competition among neighboring males for pride ownership you'll have potential sub evictions of, sorry, potential evictions of sub adults, not yet at sexual maturity. And you can get infanticide of the existing pride's cubs if another male comes in. And so when you get this displacement of individuals, um, a lot of those individuals will move into these marginal habitats and depredate livestock. So that was a big finding in my opinion and how trophy hunting can have these unintended consequences. And also, um, Moving into panel D, um, success was lower in the wet season compared to the dry season. Um, and this is because in the dry season in this system, um, largely the livestock, sorry, largely the wild prey will congregate around water holes. So the, wa so the wild prey for the lions are really super predictable because the lions know that where the water holes are, the prey will be as well. Whereas in the wet season, there's a lot more water sources. And so the wild prey get more dispersed. And so it's more difficult for the lions to hunt them. So in that case, in the wet season, lions may get tired of trying to go after wild prey and instead go after domestic prey, such as livestock, because it's just easier. So we saw that it was tougher to push lions away from livestock in the wet season, just because it was so much harder to be hunting wild prey. So in terms of that undesired behavior, so in this case, it was the lion entering that exclusion zone, that area where it wasn't supposed to be. So we had nearly 400 entries from 15 different lions and they would return every three days, more or less. And we found that um, adult females were 2.2 times more likely than adult males to enter the exclusion zone. And sub-adult males were 1.6 times um, more likely than adult males to enter the exclusion zone. So we're seeing that adult females are, are the kind of um, most notorious at entering the exclusion zone, followed by sub-adult males. And adult males tended to be the most stable um, in terms of not displaying these types of behaviors. So in total, before I explain this figure, um, we had 173 animals killed by nine collared animals. 
So first of all, a social factor. Um, Subadults were much more likely to depredate livestock in general. So the subadults are in the dotted line, the adults are in the, the solid line. So um, the second question was, okay, so what is the percentage of depredations um, that is followed by a chase? So when lions are chased 40% of the time after depredating livestock, you see that um, there's very little probability of a repeat depredation. So that's the green. So when they're chased 40% of the time after a depredation, that repeat probability really goes down. Whereas when you chase them 0% of the time after depredating livestock, you're gonna see sky high probability of them redoing that behavior. So really that means just be consistent in that application of the chase. After a depredation, go after them because if they continue to depredate without um, punishment, it's just going to increase that behavior in the future. So really there is the need for a stronger reinforcement between the undesired behavior and a negative stimulus, such as the chase. Also, um, we found that, um, again, subadults in general were more likely to depredate livestock um, compared to adults in the solid color. Um, but also, those lions that had more experience killing livestock had greater depredation rates in general. Um, so we can see, um, you know, it, here, we had repeat livestock killers. They killed an average of 29 animals for one lion killed 60, sorry, killed 56 individuals. So some of these lions are killing a lot of livestock. So when a lion had killed, you know, 20 animals, the probability of a repeat depredation was super, super high, around one. Just kind of a guarantee that if you've already killed 20 individuals, that you are going to do it again. Whereas if you'd only depredated once, um, there was a much lower probability, especially if you were an adult, it was anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of doing it again. So again, with that longer history of poor behaviors, the more likely um, it is for that behavior to reoccur. Um, so again, there is a need for that negative reinforcement of the chase to outweigh um, the positive reinforcement of these lions depredating livestock. So conclusions quickly are that um, the chases of these lions are less successful um, when there's a greater distance between the lion and the protected area boundary. So again, when these lions are deep within the communal land, it's just a lot more difficult to push them out. In addition, with larger prides, um, it's just tougher to chase eight lions compared to one or two. They're less successful in the wet season because again, the wild prey are really, really dispersed. And so therefore um, lions may be um, more, um, more willing uh, to go after domestic stock because it's just an easier kill. And um, chases are less successful after the removal of a pride male just because of the social upheaval that results and the eviction of subordinate individuals. And consistent intervention is really, really important in um, reducing future um, behaviors of entering community lands and depredating livestock. And that is especially true for the subadult age class because they're the most at risk of, of depredating livestock in particular. So um, the second question was, um, are African lions altering their resource selection in a manner that would lead to reduced human lion conflict? So the first question was, you know, basically in direct responses, in direct response to a chase, you know, what are they doing? How is their behavior in terms of entering community lands and depredating livestock changing? Whereas this question is more about, you know, before the program started and now after the program has started, how are lions using um, habitat? Are they using it in a different way now compared to before? So this is taking the chase kind of out of the equation and just comparing before the program, after the program, how is there a space use, how has it changed? So um, we use the risk disturbance hypothesis as our framework here, which means that essentially, when you have long-term intense human-caused disturbance stimuli, in this case being chased by people, um, it's basically like predation risk. Um, but in this case, there isn't a lethal outcome because the guardians aren't um, 
killing the lions, uh, it's more of a, a fear response. But we thought that in response to the presence of these people on the landscape, um, there are two alternatives for lions. So we, we thought they could either leave and seek refuge elsewhere. And in that case, we would see them moving their home range into the national park. Um, or if they didn't shift their range, they were just selecting more for the national park within their existing home range. So maybe they can't shift because of a territorial individual nearby, but then within that home range, they would be selecting more for the national park. Alternatively, if they're not leaving and if they're not using the park more, maybe they're just staying and finding ways to reduce risk. And in that case, there would not be a home range shift whatsoever, but there would be an avoidance of areas near households and there would be a use of greater vegetation cover when near households. So again, we thought these, there were these two different alternatives that lions um, could be implementing. So what I saw in the GPS data were about three different scenarios um, illustrating possible program impacts. And this is real data from, from real lion individuals. So in panel A, we see a lion doing kind of exactly what we want it to do. So we see and that this is a sub-adult male. Um, and it was causing a lot of trouble in panel A. The communal lands are in yellow and the, the green outline is the national park. So we see it causing a lot of problems in the upper left. And then after the program began, all of a sudden that lion is firmly within the national park. So that is exactly what we want to see. In panel B, we don't really see much of a change. This is kind of a neutral outcome where the lion is just kind of in that space between the park and community lands and it doesn't really have much of, of a difference in terms of its habitat use. And then in panel C, we see um, something quite bad um, where this was, I remember this was an adult female, where the adult female was a problem before um, and then it gets even worse after in terms of that overlap with community lands where there's actually two areas where that lion has gone in um, and likely depredated livestock or um, caused a ruckus um, where people are living. So we really wanted to see A um, and we didn't want to see C and we were going to use a statistical framework to find out what they were doing. So for this analysis, we had 18 lions. Um, we had six adult females, five adult males, and seven subadult males. For whatever reason, there weren't uh, collared subadult females. Um, and we had seven treated animals and 11 control animals. So these lions, first of all, needed to have data before and after the Long Shields program was initiated in June 2012. So we needed long-term data from these lions. And in order to be a treated lion, the lions had to have been one step length from a household um, and can be considered exposed to the program. So treated lions are the ones coming real close to households and getting themselves into trouble. And the control lions just aren't really coming near. So we can say that they likely haven't been exposed to the program. So we're seeing how um, has their selection changed. So first we evaluated their home range shift. So again, lions have seasonal ranges based on you know, wet season, dry season. So we calculated each lion's um, seasonal home range in each year and each season, wet and dry. And then we calculated their overlap with the national park. And we essentially used um, a repeated measures ANOVA to determine um, uh, whether um, Treated lions, for instance, had moved into the national park, whereas there was really no difference in the control lions. Our second question um, was, um, again, it's a fancy term, resource selection function. But here we were asking, when the lions are placing their home range, um, what are lions selecting for in their habitat, given what is available? So again, when they're placing their home range, given the availability of habitat, what are they choosing to use? Um, and so our model included distance to water hole. That's water in that equation you see there. We included um, vegetation greenness. And so we were basically controlling for distance to water hole, controlling for productivity with the vegetation greenness. We were also evaluating their selection for the national park. And we were also evaluating their selection for distance to household and how that related to percent tree cover. Because again, we thought that maybe the lions approaching households may be coming in under greater cover. 
So we had over 4,000 households in our study area and the essentially the home ranges of the control lions included the majority of the park and the treated lions um, included a bit less. So um, in general, our conclusions, first of all, males were just more mobile, they moved more. So on the left and right, that is the treated lions and the control lions, and the top are the males and the bottom are the females. So there was no effective treatment really, which is on the left and right. But what we do see is that in general, males just move more. So in between their seasonal home range centers, males move about two times the distance compared to females. So males move about seven kilometers in between, females move about 3.5 kilometers in between. Um, what this is showing us is that there's just more behavioral plasticity, more behavioral flexibility in males to move. Um, when we're talking about African lions, um, males will have left their natal prides, natal meaning where they were born, by age four, and they'll, you know, they'll remain solo or they'll join coalitions with other males. Um, so they are they are accustomed in their history to to leaving and and you know patrolling territory and claiming territory, whereas females do tend to do tend to stick to their natal prides. So that's one reason why we're seeing this greater mobility in males. This is a big finding. So this is the big we. Um, treated male lions, so the males are on the, the left, females are on the right, and then within each block we have treated and controlled. And so we're measuring here the proportion of their home range that overlaps the national park. And we see that before versus after, so before is in gray, after is in black, we're seeing that treated male lions increased the proportion of Huangi National Park within their seasonal ranges by about 20%. And this was the sig only significant response that we saw in this analysis. And it was the most consistent behavioral response that we saw among lions in the study. So again, we saw treated males really increase their proportion of the park within their home range, whereas Control males, control females, and treated females didn't really show that shift at all. So the treated males are shifting into the national park. No other category of lion was. The lions that were staying and, and reducing their risk, this is a gross oversimplification of the results, but we found that um, the ones staying and reducing risk were about 42% of lions in a given season. And they were largely female, so 80% were female. And, you know, in general, females are less likely to shift because, um, again, they tend to stay in their natal prides. And in fact, if they were to seek other territory, they risk aggression from neighboring prides. They also risk infanticide, meaning their um, cubs are killed by um, foreign males. So females just have a lot more to lose, which is why we didn't really see them shift their range. So the conclusion of this chapter um, broadly again was that aversive conditioning can alter large scale space use by lions, um, but not all will be responsive. Um, and again, um, we found that males were quite responsive, but adult females, it'll be more difficult to get that same response um, because they do tend to stay in their natal territories and they have a higher cost of leaving, especially when cubs are present. So in general, um, the conclusions that, that we pulled together from both of our questions are that, you know, social forces are likely pushing lions into community lands and keeping them from moving back out. So again, we have these periods of social upheaval, um, subordinate individuals are being displaced into community lands and are less likely to leave when they are chased. Again, so during this social upheaval, you know, there was, um, a uh, 56% chance of success versus 88% when there wasn't social upheaval. So these social forces are really having an impact on the lions and subsequent conflict. So we found consistent early intervention was important. So again, like we really want to get um, consistent application of the chases in order to reduce unwanted behaviors. And also early was important. So just this is anecdotal, but the three chased individuals um, that failed to depredate livestock were very young. They were um, um, in the sub-adult or young adult age class. 
And so this highlights the amenability of younger individuals to this behavioral conditioning. So as great as this program was and having some success, um, additional approaches are likely needed, such as fencing, um, livestock enclosure fortification, especially at night, um, you know, because over this three-year problem, over, over this three-year period, um, we still had over 300 dead animals. Um, so that's a lot of loss for these people whose livelihoods depend on livestock rearing. So um, it's a matter of how much loss we expect these communities to weather. And I think that losing over 300 animals in this area is quite a lot. And so additional um, interventions are likely needed in addition to base program. So um, that was that. So thanks for listening to the research portion. And then this will probably be about a five minute overview of, um, so I get asked all the time, how did you get your start? And you know, what do you recommend to me as an undergrad or as a grad student in moving into big cat conservation? So this will be just like a, I've never given this presentation before, so we'll see how this goes. So um, one of the big things I tell people is that it's sometimes all about skills. Um, so on the field work side, for instance, um, do you know how to set up a camera trap? Um, have, do you have skills in wildlife tracking, you know, in terms of identifying species from their tracks? Um, can you drive stick shift? Um, because in Africa, largely you're driving um, four by four vehicles with manual transmission. Um, and, you know, again, on, on the analytical side, there's a whole nother set of questions. Um, do you have GIS skills? Um, can you code in R? Um, do you have lab-based genetic techniques? The thing is, is that so many people want to work in big cat conservation, right? So how are you going to set yourself apart? Um, and, you know, I didn't even have an undergrad degree in wildlife. And I know that, um, I know a lot of undergrads with degrees in wildlife management, conservation biology, and that is putting you a whole leg up on where I was um, at an undergrad level. So in my case, I used my master's degree to really get skills in quantitative analysis and GIS. That led to my PhD. Um, before that, Panthera took me because of my GIS skills. So again, um, it's important to set yourself apart um, in terms of your skills, because I think a lot of educated people are good writers, and you know, good problem solvers, but sometimes it does come down to skills. What can you bring to this project? What can you bring to this organization and this team? Next, um, network. So networking can be a really uncomfortable, awkward thing. Um, I know social anxiety is super prevalent um, and I think it affects all of us to some degree. I'm considered um, a very extroverted person and I definitely suffer from social anxiety in these types of situations. Um, but networking is really critical in getting to know more established folks and creating opportunities for yourself. So I recommend attending um, some of these conferences and I know there's registration fees and I know that that can be a financial burden, um, but there are ways to support your attendance at these meetings, especially if you're a student giving a poster um, or a talk, um, but these face-to-face -face meetings are so important and they are so much more meaningful than just exchanging an email because I know um, at the professor level, um, you know, professors are getting dozens and dozens and dozens of emails a day and they cannot keep up. And so even if you're a really bright student with a great CV, you're, you can just fall through the cracks. Whereas if you introduce yourself at, a, at an annual conference of one of these societies, you're gonna make a much larger impression. So I definitely recommend um, attending um, one of these conferences um, at some point and introducing yourself to people you admire in the field. And sometimes you need to be prepared to make a financial investment. Again, most as this is especially true for international work. So most international based projects, they're cash strapped, they need all the financial support they can get. So it's the pay to play paradigm um, that's quite popular for internships or volunteer opportunities in which interns often pay for airfare, but often have lodging and or incidentals covered. Um, there are paid opportunities. They're just a bit harder to find um, in terms of a good volunteer program that I can vouch for because I know the program decently well is Marcella Kelly's um, at Virginia Tech. On her website, she has um, 
yeah, an opportunity for young people to, to help out in the field. Um, I know that she runs field sites in Belize monitoring carnivores. So that's one example, I'm sure, of many more where you can likely pay for your airfare, but then have other things covered and you can get some really great research experience. Some paid opportunities are as field techs for graduate student projects um, that can be on the African continent, that can be within the US. Again, those are just tougher to find, um, especially if they're overseas, um, in which case you may want to get in touch with certain um, international projects and inquire. Um, again, I'm sure they're very used to those emails. So um, yeah, so in, in generally, like there are opportunities out there, but my advice is to please, please be wary of some experiences, so do your research. So I know there are some that offer the chance to walk with lions and bottle feed young animals, and there is a 0% chance that project is involved with conservation of wild populations and their habitats. So um, please do your research, and if something seems a bit sketchy, it probably is. Um, you know, I've studied jaguars for so long, and I've never even seen one in the wild, <laughs> only tracks, and I've seen them on camera traps. So that hands-on experience, I know how alluring it sounds, but um, I would highly recommend avoiding those types of programs. So um, also just, this is combining a few points. So be flexible, be proactive, and don't give up. Um, so, you know, in terms of be flexible. So the more broad your underlying research motivations, the more study species that can be at your fingertips. So a lot of times um, advisors um, could be turned off if you're just so, so focused on one species that you can't see broader ecological questions and broader patterns in a landscape you'd like to explore. So I would definitely recommend a non-species specific approach and just focus on the question. Because if you have a really good question, you can apply that to multiple species. And you know, one species could be the jumping off point to get the species that you, know, you really want to work with. So definitely be flexible in that respect. Um, I also recommend being proactive. So as I said in the previous slide, posted and paid opportunities are relatively few. So you may need to find your own niche within a given organization or academic group. In the case of my PhD, um, I actually had to shop my project around. I had good data. I thought I had interesting ideas. I had to shop that around a lot of different labs and then I found one advisor who was willing to take me on a lot of times PhD advisors they have their own projects and they're looking to bring in students for for research that they already have moving on the ground whereas I was kind of independent and coming in with my own project and so that was great it was risky but I did find an advisor um, who was willing to take me on so again you may need to just carve your own path and hope that you can generate support to keep you going and finally, don't give up. So related to the last point, I did not hear back. And again, at that point, I had six years experience in big cat conservation. I had a bunch of publications. I thought that I was pretty competitive. Um, and I did not hear back from so many people. Again, this is because I used the email approach. But I just did not hear back. And some I did hear back from, but they didn't really have the financial support for me. So, and I finally found um, someone who did. So just be prepared for a lot of no's. You just really have to persevere and um, keep your blinders on if it's something you really want. Um, you really need to um, not give up if that's what you really want. Um, so again, I already said, consider blazing your own path and prepare for rejection along the way. So um, general resources, this is the final slide. Um, that there are job boards for paid positions, academic opportunities. Uh, these are largely domestic, um, meaning within the United States. So we have, you know, the Texas A&M job board, USA jobs for, you know, opportunities with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and um, uh, USGS. Um, also, the Ecological Society of America's listserv, um, though you need to be a member of the ESA. Oh, and that's another meeting that I should have added to the um, the uh, annual conference list. And also there's a conservation job board. And for international opportunities, again, these are this is where it gets really hard um, because these types of postings are a lot more rare, but definitely continue to check out the career websites of organizations such as the Wildlife Conservation Society, the World Wildlife Fund, and Flora and, Fa eh, Flora and Fauna International. 
Um, so again, these are this is just a place to start. I'm sure there's many more resources out there. But again, if this is something that you really, really want, um, I would gain some skills and I would network and I would just not give up and go after what you want. Um, and so that concludes my talk. And I'd like these are the people associated with my PhD and with um, the on the ground management of the Long Shields Community Guardians Program. I'm really grateful to all of these people and to my PhD institution, SUNY ESF, and to Oxford University's Wildlife Conservation Research Unit. And again, thank you to Corey um, for inviting me to talk today. And um, rumor has it I may be invited next year to give another talk. So hopefully I didn't bore you to death. Um, so again, thank you guys. I'm at the 45 minute limit now. So um, thanks again. And I hope you learned something today. You can um, find out more about me on my website and you can send me an email as well if there's a question that you may have about my research. So, okay, take care guys. Thanks for tuning in.